So I will talk about the paper, Wandering and Getting Lost, the architecture of NAB activating local communities and dementia issues. Written by me, Niklas, and my colleagues Marco Chiarandini and Jacopo Mauro. First of all, I will give an overview and a brief introduction of the application in question. Then going forward, the main focus will be on the architecture of the app and the technologies used. More precisely, I will describe how exactly the app has been implemented and tested. Then finally, to wrap up the presentation, I will conclude on the results obtained from the tests and present future work. The application in question is called Sum on Demens and abbreviated SOD. It is an application implemented for a Danish municipality as a part of an initiative to improve the handling of cases where persons with dementia get lost, and to use new technological innovations in doing so. More precisely, the exact goals of the SOD app is to create awareness about dementia among ordinary citizens and to involve them in helping persons with dementia. Ultimately, this should help alleviate the anxiety of persons with dementia, along with their relatives and closest caregivers. These goals they are accomplished through certain features of the SOD app, which rely on the interaction of the following user types. So we have users with dementia, then we have next of kin users, which include closest caregivers and relatives linked to the user with dementia, and then we have volunteer users who are just ordinary citizens not linked to any specific user. So these different user types, they all have access to the following main features of the SOD app, which include a knowledge bank providing information about dementia. Then we have a recreational activity calendar where users with dementia and volunteers are able to match with each other on relevant activities. And then lastly, we have a help component that is expected to be the main component that achieved the goals of the SOD app. That is, the help component help persons with dementia and their next of kin by providing the possibility of triggering an alarm for a user with dementia in case he or she has gotten lost. The goal of this alarm is to notify next of kin users and possibly volunteers in the vicinity of the user with dementia such that these have a possibility to act. The alarm can be triggered directly by the user with dementia, the next of kin users, or in the near future when detection algorithms are implemented, it can also be triggered indirectly by the app itself if it detects that the user with dementia is wandering and getting lost. The functionality of these features, they impose certain requirements on how the app is structured. More precisely, all functionality is implemented by a backend system and users access all of this functionality through a frontend running on a portable device. This structure of the app enables the possibility of coordinating and handling all real-time user interactions through the backend system. <clears throat> Furthermore, processing of real-time user data can be offloaded to the backend system as well. These two aspects they are especially important in the context of this uh, help component. And the reason for this is that the help component process users' location data which are sent from the front-end to the back-end system at a very high frequency. The location data is used for detection purposes, but also for location broadcasting purposes in case a user with dementia has gotten lost, and relevant users need to know the location of the user. With these things in mind, the design of the back-end system should be such that it is scalable and can process an expected high throughput of location data efficiently and reliably, Furthermore, the backend system should be maintainable and structurally flexible, allowing the possibility to implement and easily apply in the future AI techniques for detection purposes. Due to these requirements, we uh, have adopted microservices and serverless functions as these types of architectural components, they offer several advantages in this regard. Right. So we now focus on the architecture of the backend system and the different software components that actually implement the functionality of the previously mentioned features. At the core of the backend system, Kubernetes is used for running all microservices and serverless functions that are necessary for the app to function as intended. The entry point of the system is an ingress controller that handles all communication in and out of the cluster. This ingress controller redirects most traffic to the orchestrator microservice, indicated here as a dashed box. But it also reserves a direct route to some additional microservices used for efficiently serving photos and monitoring different metrics of the cluster. 
As indicated in the figure, microservices, they are developed using the Django REST framework, and each microservice is paired with a Postgres database for storing data. The orchestrator microservice is responsible for routing requests to other microservices through Redis, which is used as a message queue and key value store. The orchestrator microservice also handles user creation, activation, and so on, along with authorization and authentication. Lastly, it also handles WebSocket connections for real-time bidirectional communication between users through the backend. Right. The help component is implemented by microservices 3 and 4. Here microservice 3 acts as a database buffer and handles bulk operations on raw location data that arrives at the backend. Microservice 4, on the other hand, handles the coordination of serverless function execution triggered through the OpenForest Gateway. The OpenForest Gateway can be understood as the interface to the OpenForest framework for invoking serverless functions that run workloads. So this component is quite important as OpenForest provides the infrastructure for implementing the wandering and getting lost detection algorithms. Right. Then finally, the functionality of uh, the previously mentioned recreation activity calendar, it has also been implemented as a separate microservice. Beyond this, other utility microservices and components, they're also used, but for now I will not go into further details with these. To ensure that the backend system we designed is scalable, efficient, and reliable, we evaluated the system through load tests. How exactly we did this is what I will explain in the following. So we deployed the backend system to Microsoft Azure. More precisely, we set up a Kubernetes cluster consisting of a master and a worker node. The two nodes, they're simply general purpose virtual machines running Ubuntu and using standard HDD storage. For the components running in the Kubernetes cluster, we configured auto-scaling as well. So for microservices and open, open fire serverless functions, this means specifying one, a minimum and a maximum number of replicas that can be run, two, CPU and memory resource requests for each replica, and lastly, how exactly auto-scaling is triggered. So for microservices, auto-scaling was configured to be triggered based on the CPU utilization, while auto-scaling for open fire functions were configured to be triggered based on the incoming requests per second. So, the load tests, they target the infrastructure used by the help component shown here in the, the figure. The reason for this is that the demand for this part of the system is expected to be the highest. So the load tests, they measure the performance of this part of the system under the following conditions. So the front-end application of an active user sends HTTP post requests with location data to the backend system every one to five seconds. This stream of location data eventually arrives at the anomaly detection services where raw data is saved to a Postgres database and location data is placed into a Redis queue corresponding to the active user. After a number of locations have been placed into the Redis queue, a serverless function is invoked and the data in the queue starts being processed. So in these load tests we present here, an invoked function simply compute a moving average of the incoming location data as long as there's data left in a Redis queue. Right, so let us move to the results that we got using this experimental setup. What we observe here is that we considered two load testing scenarios. Each of the scenarios and the results that we got, they're displayed in a column each. What we have in just a single column is the number of active users sending post requests to the backend system. Next, we have the rate at which requests are being processed. Then we have the median and 95th percentile response times of the post requests. And in the last three panels, the CPU utilization of key services are displayed. Here, each color gradient is simply uh, a replica of a microservice or open fire function consuming computational resources. So we considered a fixed increasing decreasing demand scenario and a varying demand scenario. In the two scenarios, we used as a starting point 2,400 active users. What we then observe is that as more users they start the application and become active, we handle an increasing number of requests per second. At some point when the number of active users peak, then we observe that the response time increased considerably as well. 
we interpret this as an indication that the saturation of resources is reached. And we observe this in both of the scenarios shown here. So if we look at the computational resources used by the microservices and the open fire serverless functions, then we observe that the services they are able to scale and cope with the demand patterns. Most interestingly, in the first scenario, we can observe that the demand is evenly distributed among open first functions, while in the second scenario, some open first functions they are able to start earlier than others. These then pick up the demand and do more work. They thus consume more resources, as shown here. Um, what this basically shows us is that we have a, a sort of a reactive response to this increase in, in demand. Right. Furthermore, what we can observe here is that all requests, they are handled efficiently and reliably and without failures. Though we do see that the response time does increase when we go beyond 5000 active users. So for the conclusion, what can I say? We designed the backend system of SOD relying on microservices and serverless computing. With this choice, we have a system that is structurally flexible, allowing the possibility to easily maintain and extend the system. Furthermore, through the load tests, we confirmed that the architecture is able to cope with the different types of load. The architecture is able to scale appropriately and handle the incoming data efficiently and reliably without failures. What is left now is to implement AI techniques and build out the open first execution pipeline for the detection of wandering behavior. As the last thing, thank you for your attention. Hi, Nicholas. Are you ready? Uh, yes, just a second. Okay, okay. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. I was uh, I was looking through the, the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. It's confusing for me too. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for your presentation, for your video. This is the third section of our workshop. Well, my name is Elisa Makagawa. I'm from University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil. I, uh, and I'm working with uh, software architecture for many years. And this section is about architecture. And I think the three papers of this section is very, very interesting. Uh, these uh, papers are dealing with or addressing architecture, software architecture of healthcare system. Thing for me it was very, very interesting to check, to read, to review these papers. Okay, and I would like to invite the the, the audience to put questions for Nicholas. Very interesting paper. Then I would like to say some words about your your work. It's a very interesting uh, domain, the dimensional issues. Uh, yeah, and uh, I love uh, your paper, uh, reading your paper, the description about the architecture, about technology used in this, this paper is very new. It's very new, in particular in the healthcare area. Then it's very interesting. It's very interesting to uh, explore the this new uh, architecture style microservice for this uh, set of this class of system. Uh, microservice is very uh, used in, in the industry now. Uh, in, for instance, Netflix is full Microsoft oriented architecture. Then I think it's necessary to uh, investigate uh, Microsoft in the healthcare to using uh, microservice for communication, connections, or to modularize me uh, better uh, system this year. Then congratulations for the initiative. I think it's a very, very interesting talk, yeah? Um, well, I've, I will use the sign of the audience to put my question for you, Nicholas. Thank you again for your presentation, for your submission too. It's very interesting for the hour workshop, okay? Um, reading your paper, I saw uh, some words related some works related to your, your system. Uh, what uh, are other similar solutions for this? And what's the difference uh, between your solution, your system, and the others that you mentioned in the, I think in section six? One of the last sections of the paper, I guess it's it's mentioned in the, the last sections here. Yes. Um, so I guess what we present here um, in this work is sort of like a, a complete uh, system, so to say. Um, um, and, and what we sort of like the, the novel aspect of it, um, I'd say, is is that it's uh, it's in the form of a phone application, right? So it's uh, very accessible to to people, um, and sort of in comparison to 
to uh, other works. Um, they sort of they use other types of um, data, other types of sensors. Um, I guess uh, what we use here, we use location data from a mobile phone. And what other works use, um, they use sensor data from other types of uh, devices. I guess you can get data from uh, our ID sensors or, or what, it, what are they call like IFRD um, tags and things like this. So they use um, other technologies. And I guess they've studied, uh, they have like separate studies. What we're re really trying to do here is, is build a system that is uh, completely open source and available to uh, everyone basically that wants to dig into to the code here. Um, and, and the idea is sort of like to present these different components of the system um, as like a series of, of articles and a, a series of components. So what we focused on here was the architecture mm -hmm. of, um, of the application. And there's a, another article planned where we sort of focus on the machine learning aspect. So the, the aspect where we try to detect disorientation um, behavior in a, in a person with dementia. So, so the idea is sort of here to, to present like um, a complete package, so to say. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you for your, your answer. We have a question from Giovanni. Uh, he said, when you started the, this amazing project, did you easily find materials to create and maintain microservices? Um, so this, uh, this project here is actually a bit of a, um, bit of a journey for me because my background is in applied mathematics. Um, so I'm actually, I'd say I'm, I'm quite new in this, this field. This is the first uh, software development project I've actually been uh, working on. Um, so I actually start, started out developing like a monolithic system that is um, uh, basically a system that is pa packaged as one unit where we have all functionality in, in a single system. Um, and I'm basically, I'm, I'm developing the backend system and I'm working with a front-end developer. And I had a lot of problems um, like making changes because I'm, I'm working both on the, like the user interface or um, what do you say, like, um, like the API for the front-end application. And I'm working on the detection approach as well. And to be able to work on those things separately, um, um, it, it's, it's a lot easier with microservices because you're sort of uh, following this principle of separation of concerns. Um, so it's sort of like, uh, initially I did not find a lot of material with respect to like how to structure microservices, how to actually create them. Um, I started off with this framework called Django and it's with that framework, it seems like it's not very common to create microservices actually. So I did have to um, invent my sort of my own pattern, my own approach to developing microservices with that, that particular framework. Um, but I've sort of, uh, you know, like looked up best practices online, um, followed what other people have done like on GitHub when they've developed uh, microservices. And, and that's sort of what I've, let me to this architecture here in the end. Okay, thank you. I hope that's enough. Okay, uh, Aura has uh, a, question, a question here. Did you consider other alternatives to PostgreSQL uh, SQL database? Uh, yeah, so so initially we considered using uh, MySQL, um, but we looked through, um, I guess, uh, benchmark studies where you sort of compare, read, write, speeds for each of these database systems. Um, and in most of the studies, we, we found that um, that actually Postgres seems to be, that seemed to be the better solution. Um, and yeah, furthermore, it also integrates quite well with this uh, Django framework. Um, so that seems to be the preferred database to use with that particular framework. So there's a lot of material available um, when developing a web application with that database that type of database. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? No, yeah, I have some questions here. <laughs> I, will, I will use this time to do questions for you. How required to the or collected to develop this system? Because in the area of healthcare, 
uh, it's very difficult to find or to um, define exactly the right requirements for the system. You interview some of uh, the patients or the nurser or relatives, for instance? Uh, so I actually did hear the first part. So the, the, uh, the, there was some, some noise. So could you repeat the first part? So, what the, so you're talking about like the requirements of the system? Yeah. How you collect the requirements for the system? You interview the um, users or patients or nurses? Um, so, so how uh, the, the project started out uh, was actually like uh, that. Me and my supervisor, we the, we defined uh, the requirements ourselves. And then we entered into a discussion with the municipality, um, like what they they wanted this app to, what what they wanted the system and this application, what they wanted it to be, um, and we sort of ac accommod accommodated that into the requirements. Me and my supervisor, the, the requirements we set up. Okay. Um, and what we're currently doing right now is we're um, so actually next week we're going to have a workshop with some some uh -huh. persons with dementia that actually do have uh, dementia, and the idea is to to get uh, feedback on the yeah. application. Like, can they actually use the interfaces? Uh, do all of the the dynamics in the application? Do all of the actions and input fields and do, do the text feel right for for that type of person? We're actually trying to to sell the app to. So to yeah. say it, it's, I mean, it is an open source project. Everyone can sign up, but I mean, that's the segment we're targeting. So of course we want to tailor the application to, to that segment. And yeah. we're doing that through a series of workshops. Yeah, yeah, it's necessary to validate this interface or the usability of the, the this app uh, and, and from using real-world patient users then for the area of healthcare system, it's necessary to uh, be good alignment users. Then we have this problem here in Brazil too. Then it's not easy to find the requirements and to validate this requirement. Then it's necessary to do workshops to get the, the real world users. Okay. Uh, Nicholas, we have uh, um, less than one minute, then the platform will break the connection. Then I would like to say thank you very much for your I had all the questions here, but I we need to continue for the very much, Nicholas, for your presentation and congratulations for this initiative. It's very, very interesting for the area. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs>